Oh, that started when I wasn't expecting it to. Okay, so that was unusual. Uh, sometimes I have the phone set up on there, ready to go. And lo and behold, it starts without me even touching it. So I guess I've started Notcast 297. And um, today is the 12th of June, 2023. It is one of the hottest days of the year. So of course, I am sat indoors, enjoying the heat in my sweltering man cave. And today I'm going to talk about a record that had its 21st birthday uh, this week. Although I didn't quite get to do it on the exact day because, hey, nobody is perfect. It is David Bowie's umpteenth album, Heathen. I think this is his 27th studio record. Maybe more than that. I don't know. It's a lot. Anyway, uh, released on the 10th of June. 2002 strange period of time to be a fan of david bowie strange period of time in my life as well actually come to think of it because the the release of this record directly intersected uh with a, an unusual breakup which i won't bore you with the details about because that relationship lasted one year and six weeks and uh, i live with the consequences of that to this day uh, but not necessarily always on a on frequently on a day but it's kind of weird actually when you think about it if you split up with somebody and then like you go from living with them to not seeing them ever again and you go from 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 that to kind of kind of kind of like sometimes i forget for like weeks on end um that i i was in a marriage that lasted a year and, and six weeks i think the technical term for that is a starter marriage uh which is a kind of like having a starter home one that doesn't give you any kind of like children or anything like that, which probably is the best way to describe it. Um, wish it had never happened. Can't go back in time and change it. So here I am instead talking to my phone in the middle of a heat wave about a record that came out around about that time, Heathen. So this was a relatively big hit for David. It was um, hit U number five in the UK charts in the days when the charts meant something and not when you stuck out 17 different coloured vinyl versions. And you're in the charts for one week and then you went out the next week. You know, your next week's sales was something like number 114. Uh, and I think it got to number 14 in the USA as well. And it was supported by a four-month tour, which was quite short by Bowie standards, but at the same point quite long. Certainly nowhere near as long as the tour that he did for the next record. Um, and I think, for me, it's an album that has aged far, far better than people have really given it the credit for. Um, so it was his 25th studio LP, if you include Tin Machine. Uh, it was his first one on the ISO label. And our ISO, by the way, takes its name from the 1978 tour, which was called Isolar, or however it was pronounced, which is also an anagram of Sailor. Sailor being a, um, a pseudonym that he used frequently to describe himself, a person travelling on the high seas of life. Um, I think apparently he used to post on some of the, the Bowie message boards under the name of Sailor and Came up with some very choice comments indeed, which sadly, thanks to a redesign of the message board in 2006 on his official site, means that almost all of those comments have been lost. What a great shame that would be, and nobody, it appears, seems to have archived them. Um, this, he started work on this album in, I think, January 2001 as part two of the sessions for the toy album, which I talked about a few days ago. And uh, I know normally I try to have a month or so in between albums, uh, but sometimes my brain is a bit obsessive. It's a bit compulsive. It kind of circles on certain things. And then it kind of goes today that and today heathen is the thing that I think I'm going to be talking about, by the way. Uh, there's no really no rhyme or reason to it. In fact, it was about an hour ago. I suddenly thought, yeah, I think I'll do heathen today. That's how it kind of works. So there you go. So, um, Heathen was born out of the second set of sessions for the Toy album, which I talked about recently. The second set of sessions, which started in January 2001, including two new Bowie originals. These originals being uh, Uncle Floyd and uh, I think Slip Away, I think were the songs, um, or, or maybe Afraid, which, which later got retitled, remixed, reappeared as uh, on here. Yep, Slip Away and Afraid on Heathen. Um, it was the first album that David made with Tony Visconti since 1980. And I think it was a continuation of some of the stuff that happened during Hours, uh, which up to that point had been his previous studio release. Uh, but the idea being that actually David was now playing the role of a performer called David Bowie, a rock star, a middle-aged man 
who made music for a living, who worked under the name David Bowie. It was a persona, as much a persona as any other of the personas that he's had. Uh, for example, anybody that exists in a public space or, or works as a performer has varying different aspects of their personality and depending upon who they are and what role they've got to play, they, they kind of play, play up to those particular elements. So, for example, me, I have multiple different elements of my personality. You probably work this out. There are parts of me that are quite happy to not do anything and to just kind of just sit on a sofa and to watch television and on days like these to have ice lollies. And then there are other parts of me that are quite gregarious and outgoing and quite chatty and quite funny, uh, but I find those quite exhausting. And then in the same way that if you're um, an individual that that is, you know, we all have different roles. So in my work, I'm a professional and in my not work, I'm not necessarily professional and in my home life, I'm a, you know, a friend and a brother and a dad and, and all those type of things. Um, and, but in, in this one, David Bowie was playing the role of a guy who sang for a living, sang for his supper and whose name was David Bowie. And that's not necessarily a bad role to play, by the way. Um, I think the LP title, Heathen, really, really telling at this point, kind of indicates a spiritual crisis that might be occurring, a moment where you kind of look at things and you kind of realise that, you know, the end is nearer than the beginning and you need to come up with some ideas around, well, who are you? What do you believe? What What is your, you know, what are, you, what are your key kind of ethics and morality and, and guidance structure that you have around you? Um, whilst it's a continuation of the, the Bowie persona, which he, he stepped into with ours, the the LP is, is 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 as a title is expressing a kind of post spiritual, uh, not necessarily materialistic but realistic worldview. One where you don't necessarily think about um, the afterlife or anything like that, but you think about what your future will look like. You know, is it just an accumulation of stuff, or is it, or what is it that your life is? Who are you? And there's a there's kind of like a almost a kind of a feeling that perhaps almost being born old. So a kind of like a life after God, the end of hope, the beginning of the end, the realisation that you're coming into, you know, the third act of your life, that element of birth and becoming and being. At this point, David Bowie is being David Bowie. He's not becoming David Bowie. He is most definitively being David Bowie. And in, uh, in a four-act life, which of course is obviously birth, school, Metallica and death, um, you, you, you have an approach where you're in your third stage, which is actually probably what you regard as your peak years. So you've got the momentum and you're traveling through life. And, you know, if by the time you get to his age, which his age, by, by the time you made this, I think he was like 53 or something. If you haven't worked out who you are by the time you get to the age of 53, then you're probably never going to work out who you are. I mean, you think about life as being almost like a, like a slab of granite. Like the um, the artist Michelangelo said about, I think his sculpture of David is that he just chipped away all the bits that didn't look like David, and here David Bowie is chipping away all the bits that don't look like David until you get what looks like David, and that that's who David is. Um, this album was recorded in uh, a number of studios. It was recorded both before and after the attacks on September the eleventh, two thousand and one, and those attacks really changed the philosophy, I think, of the album. September 11th, 2001, as I previously said on the toy episode, was really the event that caused the death of the toy project and album and turned it into one of the great Lost Bowie albums of all time. And so with with that in mind, and bearing in mind that as far as Dave was concerned, toy had been put onto the back burner and kind of relegated to the subs bench, there was still some some nugget of truth in that. And those two original songs, Uncle Floyd's and Afraid from that period, uh, were, were then kind of repurposed as to be part of the heathen album uh, it was recorded mostly at a place called i think uh, alliance studios uh, which was in uh, on, on a mountain it was uh, overdubbed in new york um, and the thing that they they had all the way through this was this sense of mortality that hung over the album whereas ours was was kind of like very clearly about the passing of time heathen was around that spiritual crisis that comes at the end of, of your life and there's that cliche that there are no atheists in foxholes uh, but there have been a couple of major deaths in david's circle his mum had died in april 2001 uh, freddie beretti who had uh, would been one of his stylists in the 70s had died of cancer in may 2001 then came 9 11 and uh, there was a sense of certainly during the recording of the album in the immediate aftermath of 9 11 is that you could smell 
the events have hap that happened uh, at the World Trade Center. Um, uh, I'm just kind of going to talk anecdote a little bit personally about something that happened to me, which is I, I had to go for work to somewhere that was near Grenfell Tower in the days immediately after the Grenfell Tower fire. And if you don't know what happened, a tower block in the UK, the cladding court fire, and about 70 or 80 people at least died and the entire of the tower block was gutted and burnt and, and pretty much is just like a hollow shell of nothing that stands in the middle of London. It's a horrific sight. Um, and I had to go and work there maybe two weeks after the fire. I had to go past there and you could, it smelled like, if you've ever burnt toast in your living room, and yeah, there's this smell, this acrid smell of, of just kind of ash and dust and fire. Uh, and, and that's what it smelled like. And it smelled like that no matter where you went. It was just in the air. And there was this sense that you were, Certainly when I when I, I walked around there, um, and I just got this sense that am I breathing the remains of, of dead people? Am I I'm walking past this huge mass grave? And at that point they hadn't put any covers up over um Grenfell. Um so now they they've covered Grenfell with canvas and a, a sign that, that that takes away, or more correctly, obscures the fact that really there's this huge hundreds of foot tall gravestone. In the middle of central London um, but you could smell it it was everywhere and it's one of the most horrific things I've ever experienced is that smell knowing that that's the smell of death and so the recording that took place for the album uh, in 2001 you know when you walk down the street towards the studio there's a, a smell in the air Oh, there's a smell after any fire, that smell of just something that like burnt toast, that smell of death, and you know that you're walking through a grave graveyard. It's it's horrific and haunting. And once you you never forget it once you smell it. it it's one of the worst things ever. Um and that air of mortality hung over the album like a shadow. Uh, there was a most definitely, although it wasn't intentionally inspired by 9 11 it really brought to the surface of everyone's consciousness for a period of time just how fragile this life and this civilization was and is uh, and so for, for this album there was this sense of it yeah bowie was successful he was rich and so on but the rich the, the rich die last but they always die no one not even elon musk or jeff bezos or richard nixon uh, are immortal they, they won't last forever. So there's an element of a reckoning in this album that comes through the title. Um, there are uh, 12 songs, I think, on the album, uh, and there are a number of formats that they go through. I don't think this, I think this wasn't released on vinyl until about 2013 or so. This, by the way, is the, I think, the 2015 uh, premium vinyl pressing on blue vinyl, which, by the way, I have to uh, go inside the shrink wrap to open to show you what it looks like. An absolutely gorgeous package. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why, why Bowie Vinyl was difficult to get for a period of time is because his records weren't always released on vinyl. There were sometimes they, were, they, they, they just didn't come out on those formats at all. Uh, and so, for example, Reality didn't get, a, get an issue until, I think, 2014. I don't think he even got an issue until 2012, you know, 10 years after it was due to come out. This is a, an unusual kind of period to be a fan of Bowie because we've got a format shift is that Bowie's not successful enough to have vinyl releases. Uh, lots of bands weren't successful enough to have uh, vinyl releases. So the idea of this mass produced work of art here is kind of strange and kind of weird. Um, so this is a, an unusual format. This is a triple, triple gatefold uh, and it comes on blue vinyl, uh, which is an absolutely lovely shade of blue, by the way, uh, with some really interesting kind of distressed artwork. In there. And, the, and the artwork that we've got around it, if you look at it, it's kind of very religious in its sim, symbol, symbolism. It's very clearly done. So it's almost like four stigmata up on here. The idea of scriptures that have been struck through or obscured, like people have been rewriting various verses of the Bible. For example, uh, you've got the credits that are on there. And then you've got the, uh, the, the lyrics to at least some of the songs from the album in this this wonderful circular package that is written through or is struck through. Um, so it's obscured and uh, it's just got this this idea that you're you know holding this huge tangible work of art alongside of course what what could be reminiscent of the Virgin Mary 
um, with her eyes crossed out. This idea of defacing the concept of, of idols and icons and gods and things like that. Uh, that one, of course, being uh, the, an old school biblical depiction of the, uh, the Virgin Mary herself. So that is, that's, that's the artwork to Heathen. Um, I, th I think it's a really, really great LP, actually. It's very underrated because I think at the time that it came out, it was taken for granted. I think Bowie overall had been taken for granted. He'd been successful for 30 years. He'd never really been absent for a long period of time. He'd made an album. I think the biggest gap between albums was between 1980 and 1983. Um, between, I think, um, uh, Scary Monsters and um, Let's Dance, where he was really actually been waiting out his contractual obligations to Main Man more than anything else because they had a profit share on his activity. So that's the longest gap. And then we had the gap here between Hours and Heathen, which of course had in the middle of it Toy, uh, but was this was you know, a two and a half, three year gap between records, which was the longest gap between, I think, about September 1999 and June 2002. So we start off with, with Sunday. Sunday is, I, I think it's a super strong uh, track, actually. I really love it. Very underrated. Uh, in fact, I don't know if it's still up because it might be nuked by the copyright police. I took the isolated vocals for Sunday from the 5.1 mix of the DVD. Um, and because um, there's a super audio CD, which also has a 5.1 isolated mix, you can, you can strip out the vocals of Heathen. Um, and I took those vocals and I put them over a track by Uncle. Um, and I then created a effect. I had to time the vocals correctly and put some echoes in and things to make it work. But it was effectively a Bowie remix. Um, that I did, and I've done quite a few, but quite a few remixes of Bowie tracks by using isolated vocals and things. Really, really fascinating to do. Uh, but Sunday is one of my favourite um, Bowie songs. Uh, I, I, there's just something about that that sense of the idea of a uh, a kind of like a creeping sense of the fact that nothing remains. Also, one of the rare uses of the word bracken uh, in music. Um, and it was inspired by on the uh, on the CD edition. There were multiple editions of the album when it came out, uh, but in the UK, mostly you got this version, a double CD, which featured a second uh, a second CD featuring uh, a Moby remix of Sunday, a remix by Air of a Better Future, um, a nine, a re-recording of Conversation Piece that was recorded in two thousand and two, and a version of Panic in Detroit. Which apparently it says outtake from a 1979 recording, but you know what? I'm not convinced it is. Uh, and again, it features the same kind of um, you, you kind of like trifold artwork there of the CDs and uh, lifting the trays up. Of course, I should have practiced this, but I didn't. This hasn't been out for years. You've kind of got this this sense of of, of kind of distorted, broken imagery. Of, of the idea of, of kind of like, you know, whereas people sometimes, you know, pretend to do graphic design so that it looks a little bit slapdash. This is not slapdash. This is deliberately designed to look, you know, degraded and perverted with images that you would take that would look at like religious imagery and going, well, actually, you know, you're defacing the religious imagery because as a heathen, you don't have a belief in that, that or, or the, um, you know, the, also the respect necessarily for the sacred holy imagery that other people would have. Um, track two on the album, by the way, is Cactus, cover version of the Pixies. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say it was done quickly and easily. And I think David plays every instrument on it, including the drums, which is, I think might be a first. Um, when he was sequencing the LP, I think it was the last song that was recorded for the album. I kind of realised that maybe the song needed, or the album needed something that was a bit of a lift and lifted it up a little. Um, oh, I should probably should present it like that, really, shouldn't I? Um, and the the Pixies as a band had split in 1993. They were not particularly successful. Influential, but not successful. And the idea is that the Pixies as a band were broken and successful and had been overlooked. Kind of like the Velvet Underground of the day, a band where everybody who heard them formed another band, but not everybody who'd been in the band had actually been able to make enough money out of it. And I think it was seen as a, a cover um, which, which, which drew along the influence that Frank Black had had previously. So Frank had, I think, duetted fashion with David at the 1997 50th birthday concert. Uh, Tin Machine had covered Debaser on their 1991-1992 tour, I think. Um, and 
So all the hallmarks were there, and like a number of Bowie albums, he had a you know a, a number of substantial originals, and then bolstered that out with some well-selected cover versions. Now I think on 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 record, Bowie's cover versions aren't amazing. They've never been amazing. He, I mean, full credit to him for giving a hand up to the artist that he clearly loves and respects and doing his best for them. But I don't think that any any Bowie cover version is ever really particularly great at all, especially not the cover version of Love Missile F111, which is in the uh, the reality era, which I haven't talked about yet. Um, so Cactus being a Pixies track kind of just kind of, he kind of like just passes through and you listen to it and you kind of go, yeah, it sounds like it's a David Bowie track. But on the other hand, you kind of go, well, how much of it is David Bowie being influenced by the Pixies and how much is the Pixies being influenced by David Bowie? And then, yeah, like uh, in the way that when Morrissey covered, I know, uh, or more correctly, when Morrissey did, I know it's going to happen someday. And then that turned at the end into a, basically a carbon copy of Rock and Roll Suicide. And then Bowie covered, I know it's going to happen someday for his Black Tie White Noise album. There's that sense of going, so it's David Bowie covering the Pixies, covering David Bowie, although it isn't, but it is. It's a very interesting kind of concept, kind of like the idea of an art artistically of like a snake eating its own tail. Track four uh, is Slip Away. Well, track three actually is Slip Away, previously known as Uncle Floyd on the uh, on the unreleased version of Toy. Um, and it has a slightly different mix, I think, on the Super Audio CD of Heathen, uh, but nothing particularly substantial. I, th I think um, I think uh, Slip Away is a great track, actually, um, although obviously previously known as, as Uncle Floyd. And it, it kind of also kind of ties in with a number of the other things. There's an element of nostalgia, an element of looking at things from their childhood, whatever those things might have been, and recontextualising those as, as adults. Now, I did that during lockdown, because lockdown was very, very long. And not only did I start a YouTube channel, which nobody watches, um, I also went through and said, right, I'm going to rewatch all the Star Treks. I'm going to rewatch Blake 7. I'm going to rewatch Airwolf. I'm going to rewatch all the things I watched when I was a kid and see if they're any good now. The answer is generally no, they are. But for example, watching something like Watership Down as an adult, I mean, that's still horrific. But watching it as a six or seven year old and people kind of going, well, you know, it had cute rabbit, rabbits in and it's animated. It must be lovely. And you end up, it's like this horrible kind of almost horror movie type thing about rabbits being being kind of terrorized by other rabbits and you kind of go that's not suitable for children you know like like an Ari Aster film I kind of sat there and going I'm not sure anyone's old enough to ever watch this I'm certainly not mature enough to go and watch Watership Down again and uh, I'm, I'm 50 soon um, and then we have track four which is uh, Slow Burn. Slow Burn was the uh, the first single uh, that was released from the LP, and, and bizarrely, unlike a number of songs, it was it was played live, uh, but it was only played for promotional TV appearances and for the first two shows of the Heathen tour. It was dropped after that. Um, here's a it was released as a CD in in some parts of the world. Here's the CD single, the three track CD single that I think was released in I think um, somewhere like Italy or Austria. I can't remember exactly where. And um, and it, it's got this um, it's got guest guitar on it from Pete Townsend returning the favour. Um, from from previously, where uh, two thousand and one, Bowie had covered uh, the Who's pictures of Lily for a Who compilation LP, and then later on, um, obviously there was a, a track which I think it was Baby Loves That Way or You've Got a Habit of Leaving, which Peter Pete Townsend had heard of, went, oh, you're copying us, are you? Very interesting. So it kind of all comes around full circle. There is a, a quote from uh, Luke twelve thirteen of the Bible, uh, which, which kind of uh, is, is mentioned in in the lyrics, uh, and there's also when you when you listen to the lyric of of uh, slow burn, there's there's an element of, and this is this is quite interesting, uh, kind of like the idea of it's revisiting the ideas around having a doomed society, uh, which is which has been listened, which has been kind of alluded to in some of the tracks uh, David had recorded previously, like We Are Hungry Men, 1984, Dodo, Big Brother, etc., all that type of stuff. The idea of a fallen society that. Had, uh, yeah, basically civilised itself to death and it had ended up like Caligula or something. Um, track five is Afraid. Afraid uh, also appeared on the Toy album, first debuted on the 2nd of November 2000, so it was uh, yeah over 18 months old by the time it got um, a release on Heathen. And then track six is I've Been Waiting For You. Now this is this is a, a strange choice, it's a Neil Young track, uh, but it was it was uh, performed by Tin Machine in 1991, where it was sung by Reeves Gabrels. 
Um, and I think that's on the uh, the VHS of Oy Vey Baby or Tim Machine Live in Berlin or Live at the Docks or whatever it's called. Uh, but it's also got, um, it also follows the Pixies because it is, it's actually, it's practically a cover version of the Pixies cover of the Neil Young song. So it's not really a cover of Neil Young. It's more a second cover of the Pixies. Um, but it follows the the structural approach that the Pixies cover version has, which is you halve the show, halve the guitar solo, and uh, you you um, rewrite a verse and you add it instead of the second part of the guitar solo. Interesting thematic trick and uh, affects the structure a little bit. You wouldn't necessarily listen to it and think, hmm, that's missing half a guitar solo. So not a bad idea. Um, there's a longer version of I've Been Waiting For You on the Super Audio CD. I don't have the Super Audio CD, so you just have to pretend that I know what it really sounds like. I don't. Um, and track seven is I Would Be Your Slave, uh, which I think I think is a cover. Uh, I could be wrong. I don't have much memory of that track at all. Uh, and then we have track eight, which is, um, this is I Took a Trip on a Gemini Spaceship. What an unusual name for a song that is. You thought, oh, David Bowie could never write a song like that. That's just weird. Well, the short answer is he didn't. He didn't write it. Uh, there's a uh, there's an artist called the legendary Stardust Cowboy, and he recorded a track called I Took a Trip on a Gemini Spaceship. And uh, as it later turned out, when Bowie was starting to look back and think over his childhood record collection and the artists that he loved, he found out that the the uh, the artist, who was I think was Norman C. Odam, um, would, was struggling financially and was you know living in a, a house of multiple occupancy and was working as a security guard. So um, you know the money that he made from being an artist that David had loved when he was a child um, had clearly not transpired into adult wealth. And so he, so he kind of covered it to help out an artist that he loved financially. Um, it's a strange song. Um, there's a really curious remix of it actually um that was on a promotional 12 inch um and i kind of listen to it and go, it's got this this light fluffy air to it which a lot of a lot of bowie tracks don't always have and what people people kind of kind of forget is just how how flippant sometimes uh, and how playful um bowie could be people think oh it's a very very serious artist and then you kind of remember that you've got the kind of like do 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 kind of backing vocals in sound and vision um, you've got the do 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 kind of stuff that's in Walk on the Wild Side. You've got a stylophone solo on some tracks. David was unafraid to do silly and unusual, slightly funny things, and had a quirky sense of humour. Very British in that respect, I think. Um, Five fifteen. Uh, the angels have gone. Um, this is one of the most sober tracks on the album. Uh, I think lyrically. Um, the, the the idea of you know as I've mentioned before you look at the cover art inside the record the idea of the defacing of the Virgin Mary um, obscuring you know religious imagery and things like that and this which I'm sure is in no no way influenced by um, well known pictures of the seven levels of of, of hell um, in I think Dante's Inferno for example it's all kind of around uh, a, an idea of a, a loss a, a spiritual crisis of faith where you're not quite sure exactly what's going on. Um, and 5.15, The Angels has gone. It's very clearly a song that's about, well, the angels have disappeared. You know, the idea that you were able to rely upon um, indicators of, of spiritual existence and then, then for those to start to disappear and you kind of go in the kind of like the way that the ravens are bandling the Tower of London Bridge, kind of like that kind of stuff is suddenly, well, we thought we could rely on the angels, but then the angels aren't here anymore. So, you know, uh, when people says, you know, we forget about God and then God forgets about us as uh, somebody else sang, I forget who, right now. Uh, track 10 is Everybody Says Hi. And this was the main single in the UK. In fact, it was the only single released to retail in the UK because Slow Burn uh, wasn't released in the UK. Uh, and so um, I think um, Everybody Says Hi, which was released on the 19th of September 2002, had all of the b sides that were on all the various formats of Slow Burn. Um, plus some extra tracks as well. And um, Everyone Says Hi barely made it into the top 20 in the UK. It didn't stick around for very long at all. And um, it's, it's one of the, the tracks in, in Bo's later career uh, where Carlos Alomar makes an appearance, even though he hadn't been in a live band since 1995. The, the lyric is, is apparently uh, written as a message to Reeves Cabrels, who'd left the band, the idea of, well, you know, we miss you and we hope everything's okay and everyone says hi and, and everything that goes with that, that sense of, you know, a fractured 
friendship as friendships move along as they change through life as the social circles change and as we change you know the people that we knew when we were 20 we don't necessarily hang out with when we're 50. Um, but it's that, that sense of of kind of just trying to stay in touch with people and of course also that idea of trying staying in touch with people uh, once you become famous or you become rich and you end up thinking I kind of miss the people that I knew before that, but, I, you know, I don't see them or they don't believe me or if they got in touch with me, would they be only doing it? You know, kind of like, you know, if you win loads of money in a lottery and you have to tick the publicity box, you're always going to get some guy that you met once 14 years ago that's going to email and go, hey, remember me? I treated you like poo when you were poor. Can you lend me lots of money, please? That kind of that sense of, of kind of like how real and authentic are friendships and relationships and, and how do they work? Um Track 11 is a better future. Now, this also ties in with another theme that comes in through Heathen, which is the idea of, of well, what, the, what is the future? What does the future hold in it? How does it work? There's a sense, especially in the very early days of the Internet, and I know it sounds like me old father time now, but this the 2002 was about the time where broadband started to come in. So if you were on the Internet previously, you had to dial up, pay however many pence per minute. You could stay on for two hours. Your phone line would drop the fastest speed you could get would be 32k per second or maybe 64 um, and when you went over to broadband and suddenly you could get like a megabyte a second and instead of crawling along you were suddenly going at you know full speed um, and the idea was that things around the linearity of time the narrative of history all these things were starting to collapse the future was coming whether we liked it or not uh, you know and a child that was born in the 40s um, like the 1940s would be what 80 now or if you consider someone that was born now will be 80 in 21 2102 2103 and then that blows your mind a little bit when you think about possibly the idea of a child that was born in there let's say the 1920s would be 100 around about the time that heathen came out they would have been 60 um, around or more clearly they would have been 80 by the time heathen came out they would have been 60 by the time that uh, you know scary monsters came out these were still you know the idea of we are just kind of you know water passing through the stream of life or fishing in the rivers of life as the uh, KLF had it on justified and ancient which is even if you step into the stream again it's not the same stream because all the water's changed and you're not the same person because of everything that's happened to you in between the last time you stepped into the stream a better future is also this sense of of not being complacent, of not stopping. It's kind of like, I demand a better future. I demand more than I have right now, and I expect something a little bit different. Um, and then we have uh, the last track on the album, Heathen, The Rays. Uh, perfect track to end the LP on. It, it kind of feels like it's a sequel to uh, Words on a Wing and Station to Station. It carries inside it a kind of like a knowledge that death is inescapable, that fate and history are intertwined, there are certain things, there are certain defined points on the uh, on the path of life that you can't avoid. As I mentioned earlier, birth, school, Metallica, death. Um, the idea that death is inevitable, it's inescapable. Um, and it's a song seen from the point of view of someone alive kind of addressing their own immortality, their own sense of knowledge that in the midst of life we are in death, etc. etc. Um, and... Uh, it's got um, this this kind of like really unusual kind of also tying in with the imagery that we've got here around the defaced deities and religious imagery that's inside the, the sleeve is that that kind of sense of, of staring down the barrel of mortality and going, who am I? What do I believe? Was it all worth it? All those type of questions that come through. Um, and, and I think it's a very, very solid Bowie LP absolutely really very good the problem was of course it being his 25th studio lp and his 25th studio lp in 34 years uh, you would you know if you didn't like the, the latest Perry lp there was another one that was going to come up in a couple of years time anyway uh, and people were just kind of taking it for granted that he was always going to be here. And they kind of go, well, should I see David Bowie? Or oh, you know, maybe I'll go on holiday somewhere and I'll see him the next time he comes round. Without necessarily realising that there might not be a next time. There might not be another opportunity to do it. Smoke them while you got them, kids. Including 
your pop stars, um, which is why I always try and go to see acts when they tour, because you never know when's going to be the last time. Every time I see a band, unless I know I'm going to be seeing them tomorrow or next week, I tend to think this could be the last time I see the act. And, and that's quite a fatalist way of viewing it. But it's also you have to be really, really realistic and go, that could be. That could be true. You know, the last time that I saw, let's say, uh, David Gilmore, admittedly, he was 74 at the time, I think maybe maybe 70 i kind of had this view that i might be running out of opportunities to see him i might be running out of times to see him i mean certainly i feel like that about parents like acdc or iron maiden i'm kind of thinking in my head they've got five years ten years maybe at most and then their bodies aren't going to be able to do what they used to do you know and i've seen definitely i've seen footage of acts where they should have quit a tour before and yeah, it's a really kind of sad experience to see when a band just isn't quite as good as it once was because simply their bodies just can't do what they need them to do anymore. It, it's 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 not something that you want to see when you can see someone starting to fade in front of your very eyes. But then if you've ever had anybody in your family that's has had a health condition, that's had, you know, dementia or cancer or anything like that, you can see it happening in front of your eyes. You can see them leaving, even though they haven't yet left. And it, it, it's, um, it's a moment where you kind of think, you know, for this at least, Bowie had been touring pretty much solidly for 30 years. He'd been making records for 35 years. There was a sense of, he's always going to be around. And because as a an art form, I think music was relatively immature at that point. Things like reissues, reunions, all those types of things. People were only just starting to get to experience them. You know, Elvis had been, what, the first precursor of rock in maybe 1958. David Bowie started making records in 1964. There wasn't really very much in the way of a path that had been laid out for artists around, well, this is what you do when you get to this age. This is how you work. The only acts that are really consistently starting to explore that, um, what is it to do rock in, in really, really old age? Are people like Rolling Stones and Roger Waters and people like that that have been going since the very early 60s. Um, and that's the thing where you're actually you're making it up and you're seeing people learn and understand in real time before your eyes. What is it to be old and be a rock star? What happens when you've rocked your last role? You know, these are the things which which I think at the time that Heathen came out, people were still quite blase about it. Oh, good old Bowie, he'll be there forever. We can afford not to release an LP of his in 2001. He'll have another one out in a year. And lo and behold, they were absolutely right with Heathen. So, yeah, there we go. Really great LP. I think it's aged very, very well. And it was overlooked at the time. It certainly aged far better than Never Let Me Down Again. And, of course, the uh, the two CD version of it here uh, with uh, the, the bonus tracks was often the only the only version of it that you could get for a, a an extended period of time. Oh, he's fallen over. He's upside down. Um, the <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah, and then you've got the, the cover art there of, of David having his eyes almost kind of uh, made as if he's got cataracts or something. The idea of being, well, he can't see. So even if, you know, God manifested himself in front of his eyes, he wouldn't necessarily be able to see it. So there are uh, two single releases or three single releases, depending on where you are in the world, for this album. Uh, in uh, The first single to be released was Slow Burn. As I said, there was a number of versions which was released in Austria and Japan. This is the Australian CD single. And uh, it, what it has, by the way, a really unusual cover is actually it's got um, Bowie's head grafted onto a model uh, carrying a, a, a baby. And it wasn't released in the UK. The reason it wasn't released in the UK, and in fact, Bowie's singles pretty much tailed off at this point, was simply because he'd seen the rise of iTunes. He'd seen the rise of broadband. He kind of thought, well, actually, a CD single as a format is starting to reach its, its end. So what is necessarily really the point of releasing it? So this CD single is backed with Wood Jackson. And Shadow Man, Shadow Man being one of the tracks that was recorded in an earlier form for Toy. And since nothing good ever gets lost, uh, the other B-sides which came out around about this period, which were When the Boys Come Marching Home, You've Got a Habit of Leaving, and Baby Loves That Way, uh, were, I think, remixed, I think, a little bit. The production credits are slightly different on the single than they are on the uh, on the album version of Toy. Uh, in one one way, I think that was contractual. So just if you get somebody to remix it, it's not the same track that, that Virgin turned down. So therefore, it can't be a, it can't be tied and restricted to the Virgin catalogue. 
uh, a very handy move there, which also explains why there's so many different versions of so many different tracks on the on the toy box set here. Uh, but there was also uh, in uh, the um, in the UK there was a uh, three CDs for Everybody Says Hi, uh, which included all of those B sides plus a track called Safe and a, a Metro mix of Everybody Says Hi. Which by the way, the Metro mix brilliant, but uh, has not been released on CD apart from on a uh, a Help uh, War Child compilation CD. Uh, in Canada, there was a third single that was released from the album, the cover of I've Been Waiting For You. Uh, and that was backed with the Tony Visconti remix of Sunday, and um, which is also on some editions of Everybody Says Hi. Uh, now we had the, as I mentioned before, the silver box edition of his albums, a two CD version of Heathen here. And uh, this features uh, effectively two inner sleeves plus a booklet. Um, and uh, features, you know, obviously CD1. So this is a vinyl replica, which is pretty odd considering it wasn't actually, I don't think there was a vinyl edition of it that was released at the time. If I'm wrong, I'm sure one of you will tell me uh, that I'm a hopelessly incompetent amateur because that's how it works. Um, we have the, the one CD inside a, uh, an inner sleeve and then we have a second CD inside a second inner sleeve. And the second CD on this features the, uh, the remix by Moby of Sunday, A Better Future, Conversation Piece, Panic in Detroit, all of which are on the two CD edition of Heathen. Then Wood Jackson, When the Boys Come Marching Home, Baby Loves That Way, You've Got a Habit of Leaving, Safe and Shadow Man. And Safe is a song that I think was recorded for the soundtrack for SpongeBob SquarePants and for some reason didn't quite make it onto the final release and so it was, was turned into a bonus track on the Super Audio CD and some single B-sides as well. Uh, and they're, they're all really, really good B-sides actually. Uh, there's only, I think, four songs from the B-sides, uh, which were were kind of taken from the toy album. So the idea of them being repurposed for toys is kind of true and kind of not, because you've got When the Boys Come Marching Home, um, Safe and Wood Jackson, which were not on the, uh, which were not on any configuration of toy. Um, 2002 was a pretty busy year. For Bay. Um, he could. He, he he had his meltdown festival, which um, he he programmed and, and chose many of his favourite artists to perform at. So two thousand and two, that would have included appearances by by uh, Scott, not Scott Walker, the the for example, and a number of other acts appeared. Swade as well played with an orchestra uh, at the Royal Festival Hall. Uh, Bowie played when he did his live shows. He played at all of Heathen and he played all of Low. On some of the shows, some of which were broadcast on television, and played some of his long, longest uh, sets ever, um, and was we toured for four months, including a, a you know a US festival run. Um, at the end of two thousand and two, to capitalise upon this success, perhaps with his um, intervention, in so much as he, on the grounds that he couldn't stop it, came uh, one of the definitive Bowie compilations, the best of Bowie. Uh, this was released in something like nineteen or. 20 different configurations across the world a slightly different track listing which have been customized for each country on the grounds that um, each country has a slightly different selection of greatest hits so if you put together all the different versions of the albums you've got something like 60 songs in total of which 39 are on this this is the uh, the uk version of, of the Best of Bowie, which where there was not a country specific edition of the Best of Bowie, you've got the UK edition of the release. And it's a chronological traipse through most of his singles, starting from Space Oddity and ending with the radio edit of Slow Burn. It also, and, and perhaps more interestingly for me at least, uh, saw the first release of Bowie's promo videos on DVD uh, through this, which is the standard international version of the best of Bowie, discs one and two. This features a uh, 27, now 47, official songs, plus a number of hidden bullshit extras. So Easter eggs of things like Blue Jean and, and TV appearances and stuff like that. Um, and uh, this is, by the way, very, very affordable. Uh, um, maybe not quite so... So findable these days, but the best of Bowie on DVD certainly was very cheap for a very long period of time and uh, features not remastered versions, but the DVD transfers of most of his promotional videos, or at least the ones he's not mega, mega advanced, uh, embarrassed about, 
which means you do get the video for underground, for example, and day in, day out. Uh, but you don't necessarily get all of the other really obvious ones that perhaps you might think, Where, well, where's that one come from? Um, but it's a, it's an interesting watch. Good? No. Interesting? Yes. Uh, and for the time being, probably the best place to be able to find Bo's promo videos, although his visual legacy has been, I think, massively underserved by the archive, which hopefully... Uh, will change now with the 50th anniversary release of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, which is due out cinemas pretty soon. Wow, that was a, a quick whistle stop tour through 2002 uh, for, for, for David Barry. Uh, there was another release. Very quickly going to mention this Starman, a documentary DVD that apparently was in some way officially uh, officially sanctioned or tolerated, I think, is probably the best way of describing it. It's not particularly good. It's a bunch of talking heads in DVD quality talking about how good David Bowie is. Don't don't bother. Moon Age Daydream knocks that straight out of the water. So that's 2002 for David Bowie. I think in conclusion, what I will say is, is for me at least, Heathen is, I, I think it's a really good album. It's aged far, far better than, than you might necessarily think, actually, uh, around Bowie in that particular period. And it is ripe for a re-evaluation. Inevitably, at some point, pretty soon, they're going to stick out another box set of this period. Um, and you'll get all the B-sides and you'll probably get a remix of one of the albums and some live material and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but in the meantime, um, if you, you need it, obviously pick up the silver box edition of the albums to get all the b-sides or uh, the cd singles are mostly dirt cheap these days so you can get them for like 79 pence on discogs or something i imagine uh, but they are worth having i really i really think heathen is a a good album that's been overlooked in history and it's been overlooked just purely by virtue of the fact that david bowie produced albums all the time he never took a break and uh, no matter where you were you were never more than about nine months in any one direction from a new david bowie album coming out which is pretty exciting because when this came out in june 2002 uh, it was only 16 months later that the the next david bowie lp came out and that was called reality and uh, yeah i've got some thoughts about that but i'm going to get to that in the next episode as the late great jerry springer said take care of yourselves and each other stay beautiful and uh, hopefully i'll see you all soon okay i'm going to hang up now and uh, see you later bye